Hi, these are the top 10 films of the year 1990. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. <laughs> Cheers. In at number 10, Die Hard 2. I'm not sure this makes a lot of people's top 10, but it made mine and Gene Siskel's, so, so there. This is Hollywood action done superbly, but with one major flaw. Look at the same shit happen to the same guy twice. If you can ignore that, it's a hell of a romp. Bruce Willis returns as John McClane and is once again incredibly charming and likeable as the dickhead New York cop fighting against terrorists. This time at a snowy airport where a group of renegade American soldiers have taken control of the air traffic control system. The plot has some great twists in it, but fundamentally doesn't make much sense. If you watch the film with Rennie Harlan's director's commentary, he spends much of it picking holes in his own film. It says Pacific Bell, yet we are supposed to be in Denver. Also, the fact that he is actually calling an air phone on an airplane is fiction. Obviously, planes like this don't really have ejection seats, but we decided that they would. <laughs> But again, ignore all of this and just enjoy the action, the humour and Michael Kamen's great score. Is it as good as the first one? Of course not, but most films aren't. Why does this keep happening to us? In a number nine, Close Up. This Iranian film is a really unique documentary thing. It's based on a real event where a man conned a whole family pretending to be a famous film director and moving in with them. He was eventually arrested and put on trial. This film features everyone involved in that situation playing themselves, including the con man. They are all surprisingly fantastic in it, believable and comfortable on screen. It blurs the line of what a documentary is. It has a man acting himself as he was acting someone else. It's bizarre and surprisingly emotional. How the family react to him, how they were hurt by him, and how they learnt to forgive him. It's really rather powerful. In at number 8, Tremors, a remarkably fun monster movie. Set in the small, isolated town of Perfection, Nevada, we follow two handymen, played brilliantly by Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, who end up battling giant underground worm monsters. Hey, Rhonda, you ever heard of anything like this before? Oh, sure, Earl. Everybody knows about them. We just didn't tell you. For a monster movie to work, you need a great beast. And here, the blind prehistoric worm things that follow vibrations and eat human flesh are fantastically horrible. You also need human characters to care for, and the two handymen are joined by a great cast, including Victor Wong, Hey Earl, here's some Swiss cheese and some bullets. Oh, thanks, Walter. And Ariana Richards, three years before she would flee from even more prehistoric beasts. And in scene-stealing parts, Michael Gross and Reeb McIntyre, a married conspiracy-loving gun nuts. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? In a number seven, Paris is Burning, a brilliant documentary. Filmed over many years, we get an insight into the New York drag balls. We learn about the awards, the rules, the dances, the categories, and most importantly about the people involved. The interviews are fascinating, funny, and incredibly moving. Jenny Livingston very wisely doesn't include herself in the documentary. It's not a sort of Louis Theroux enters a strange world and reacts. It's allowing the people within this world to explain it, and explain why it means so much to them. The people involved are full of life, and are arresting characters. And just as interesting as the documentary itself is looking into what happened to them afterwards. It's tragic, strange, and worthy of a documentary in its own right. Everybody wants to leave something behind them, some impression, some mark upon the world. And then you think you left a mark on the world if you just get through it. In a number six, Miller's Crossing. The Coen brothers tackle gangsters and their hats. This prohibition set crime drama has so many astonishingly inventive Cohen touches. It's a remarkable movie, but we seem to start the film with the story already in full swing. 
we enter a world where the tensions are already there and the plot is well underway. We follow Gabriel Byrne's Irish mobster who works for Albert Finney's powerful mob boss. Finney is fantastic and a highlight of the film is an assassination attempt on his life while Danny Boy plays in the background. As usual with the Coens, the characters are unique and memorable, and all played by brilliant actors, including John Turturro and J.E. Freeman. Spinner, ready? Oh! It's a beautiful looking, somber, yet funny movie. It was only the Coen's third film, and they had knocked each one out of the park. Here are some other notable releases of 1990. Macaulay Culkin tried his best to murder two thieves in the incredibly fun Home Alone. <laughs> Winning Best Film and Best Director at the Oscars was the beautiful looking Dances with Wolves. Julia Roberts and Richard Gere starred in Pretty Woman, or as it was known in China, I Will Marry a Prostitute to Save Money. Akira Kurosawa released a film based on his dreams, called Akira Kurosawa's Dreams. Europa Europa told the fascinating true story of a Jewish teenager who disguised himself as a Nazi in World War II. Tom Cruise and Tony Scott felt the need for slightly less speed in Days of Thunder. Sean Connery played a Russian in The Hunt for Red October. It is. Both Robin Williams and Robert De Niro were excellent in the incredibly moving Awakenings. Christopher Walken gave one of my favorite of his performances in King of New York. What's in the cup? You want some? Johnny Depp showed his love for working with interesting directors in John Waters' Cry Baby. Nicolas Cage was allowed to go wild in David Lynch's Wild at Heart, but stealing the show in that movie was Laura Dern's mother, Diane Ladd. <laughs> Sam Raimi made his first over-the-top superhero movie, Dark Man. Patrick Swayze made pottery sexy with Ghost. Arnold Schwarzenegger moved into comedies with Kindergarten Cop. Ha 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 ha. Quiet. It was also a big year for sequels. The final Back to the Future took us to the Wild West, while the second Predator film took us to Los Angeles. Joe Dante threw everything including the kitchen sink at Gremlins 2, the new batch. And Francis Ford Coppola made an offer you can refuse with The Godfather Part 3, which has some great things in it, but doesn't quite get to the heights of the first two films. And Gone is the more subtle Al Pacino performances of the first two films, and we're now full into shouty Al territory. Bullshit! Out of fire! Freedom! Freedom! For action, we had two Steven Seagal films, Hard to Kill, Take that to the bank. I'm gonna take you to the bank, Senator Trent. To the blood bank. And marked for death. Find him your fucking self. <laughs> well? One thought he was invincible, the other thought he could fly. So? They were both wrong. For horror fans, we had arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. The Exorcist 3, which featured a superb turn from George C. Scott. My wife's mother is visiting father. And Tuesday night she's cooking as a carp. It's a tasty fish. I, I have nothing against it. 
The experimental film, Begotten, had some truly nasty images, but scaring me most as a child was Roald Dahl's The Witches. Not remotely scary though was Troll 2. And then they're going to eat me! Oh my god! Alright, back to my top ten. In at number five, Edward Scissorhands. Johnny Depp convinced the world he had scissors for fingers in this imaginative first collaboration with Tim Burton. Depp is fantastic as the Frankenstein monster-esque tragic character made by Vincent Price. He's eventually adopted by Diane Vies Avon Lady and taken from his gothic tower to the colourful suburbs. Burton has a ball with the tacky Californian suburbanites who he grew up around in his childhood. His adoptive family is made up of great actors, including Vies, Alan Arkin and a blonde Winona Ryder. Ryder and Depp were together at the time and the chemistry between them on screen is apparent, but the best chemistry is between Depp and Burton. It's one of their best collaborations. The cinematography is great and Danny Elfman's score is magical. It's a great looking, moving, modern fairy tale. Well, I would, so don't do it. Well, this must, this must be quite a change for you, right, Ed? Yeah, Edward, dear, I think he prefers Edward. Oh, yeah, sure. In a number four, Misery. One of the best Stephen King adaptations. Hard man James Kahn is just about convincing as an author of romantic novels. After finishing his last book in his Misery Chastain series, he accidentally crashes his car in the wilderness of Colorado. Luckily, well, sort of luckily, he is rescued by a local woman who lives in a remote cabin. She is his number one fan and is thrilled to look after him. But when she reads his manuscript and sees that he is killing off the principal protagonist, Misery Chastain, things take a turn for the nasty. It's for the best. Hey, please! <laughs> Almost done. God, I love you. The simple story is fantastically told, and Rob Reiner, after making four classics in the 80s, starts the 90s with a bang, and absolutely making this movie is Kathy Bates as Annie Wilkes. She's funny, sympathetic, and terrifying in equal measure. Catch this. Mm -hmm. She overacts to just the perfect amount to create one of the all-time great cinema villains. In a number three, Total Recall, my second favourite Philip K. Dick adaptation. Paul Verhoeven adapts the short story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale and makes a bombastic Arnold Schwarzenegger action sci-fi extravaganza. Set in 2084, Schwarzenegger plays a bored construction worker who dreams of one day going to the colonized world of Mars. Eventually he decides to use Recall, a company that can implant a fake experience into your brain. He chooses to have a spy adventure, but soon it seems as if he might have actually been a spy on Mars and had his brain erased. Or has he? Is this the dream he paid for? The film has fun playing with this idea. Following his previous violent sci-fi classic Robocop, Verhoeven turns it all up to 11 yet again. The action, the madness, and the squibs. It's full of brilliantly inventive ideas and sequences, and Schwarzenegger is perfect as the unstoppable secret agent. But his audio commentary on the DVD leaves a lot to be desired, where he basically just tells you what's happening. Here, this is my job. I'm a construction worker. <laughs> I continuously used him as a human shield. Then I threw him down. Again, I got away. Yeah, there was uh, the bug that was inside my nose. In a number two, An Angel at My Table. My favourite Jane Campion movie. Based on three autobiographies of New Zealand poet Janet Frame, we follow Janet from an awkward child to a young adult struggling with mental health issues and well into her twenties as she became a poet of note. 
It's a fascinating, tender film about an astonishing artist who lived a particularly hard life. We see multiple family tragedies, her being sent to a mental institution, and even when life is going well, she is a tremendously awkward person. Bringing her to life are three different actresses. Kerry Fox plays her for most of the film and is superb, but nearly stealing the show is Alex Keogh as frame as a child. It's a totally natural and riveting performance. Jane Campion's direction and Laura Jones's script make this long film about someone going through mostly hardship, charming, uplifting and funny. A marvellous film about a fascinating person. And in a number one, Goodfellas. The 90s had only just begun and Martin Scorsese had already probably made the greatest film of the decade. What is there new to say about Goodfellas? Not much, so I'll just repeat what others have said. This is a masterpiece, an energetic, imaginative, involving, unromanticized look at the world of organized crime. We see why a child would be attracted to this lifestyle, and then it shows just how terrible and tacky that world actually is. But even by the end, the character still misses the world, and you understand why. This is what makes Scorsese one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. He gets us to see the world through the eyes of Ray Liotta's Henry Hill. Liotta is outstanding as the violent man who loves the life. We're with him all the way as he commits crimes, we get high with him on coke and just as paranoid, and we even side with him as he begins to become a rat. It's magnificent. The supporting cast is remarkable. Robert De Niro gives one of his best performances as Jimmy Conway. And that's really saying something. Lorraine Bracco is splendid as Hill's wife, who is also dragged into this awful world. But stealing the show is Joe Pesci as Tommy DeVito, a violent mobster with a short fuse. He's simultaneously funny. Funny how? I mean, what's funny about it? <laughs> and utterly terrifying. There isn't a bad performance in the picture, and the work behind the camera is equally impressive. Especially good as always is Scorsese's longtime editor, Thelma Schoonmaker. The two and a half hours fly by. The camera's also moving in inventive ways, from long takes to astonishing dolly zooms. And under all of this beauty is one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Each scene is mesmerizing, filled with memorable moments that are now forever embedded in our brains like a bullet in the head. What the fuck you looking at? Come on, make that coffee to go, let's go. Martin Scorsese is one of the greatest directors of all time, and Goodfellas might just be the best of his many masterpieces. I like this one. The dog, one dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. One is going east and the other one is going west. So what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? Right, so counting down my top ten. In a number ten, Die Hard 2. In a number nine, Close Up. In a number eight, Tremors. In a number seven, Paris is Burning. In a number six, Miller's Crossing. In a number five, Edward Scissorhands. In a number four, Misery. In a number three, Total Recall. In a number two, An Angel at My Table, and in a number one, Goodfellas. Well, those are my top ten films of 1990, and there's probably loads I've missed out. So what are your top ten films of 1990? Cheers.